So it's now my honor to award the 2019 Herzl Prize for Leadership and Ideas. Theodor Herzl undertook one of the most complex challenges in Jewish history, the return of his people to their homeland where they hadn't lived for almost 2,000 years. Brings new meaning to the word chutzpah. Last year's winner was the remarkable Natan Sharansky, whose life embodies the moral, physical courage that inspired the prize. A man who, like Herzl, was driven by an idea, a principle, more commanding than his own safety and survival. Awarded in the same spirit, this year's prize goes to Norman Podhoretz, the legendary editor of Commentary Magazine. <laughs> Commentary Magazine the most influential magazine in Jewish history, and perhaps one of the most influential magazines in all of history. Over the course of decades, Norman confronted, dissected, refuted his prevailing wisdom, refuted the prevailing wisdom of the intellectual class, media, political elites, on issues affecting the security and well-being and the democratic West, and, in, and of, in particular, the Jewish state and people. As Norman wrote, all nations are entitled to defend themselves. But when Jews in Israel exercise this right, they're accused of racism, aggression, or even genocide. Words that, unfortunately, still need repeating today. No less than with Herzl and Sharansky, Norman Pothoritz's example shows how one individual, a man with a pencil and yellow pad and a typewriter, standing firm for enduring principles, no matter the personal cost, makes all the difference. Many moral motifs, moral motifs, light motifs tie together the lives of Herzl, Sharansky, and Pothoritz. In my opinion, the one that rises above all others is their undaunted courage in the face of ridicule and attacks over the course of many, many years. Midge Dechter, who's with us here today, sitting over here, Norman's heroic and brilliant wife of 63 years captured this idea well when she said, I bring him coffee, he brings me courage. And so he has for all of us. Finally, Commentary Magazine has been blessed with three great editors over the last 60 years, only three. The gentleman we're honoring today, Mr. Pothoritz, to my right, appropriately to my right. <laughs> His successor, the remarkable Neil Kazadoy. <laughs> who is the current editor of Tikva's online magazine, Mosaic. And Norman's son, John, who has led a magazine for the past 10 years, and I think all the readers in this audience will agree, has continued its exceptional editorial excellence. <laughs> for those of you that are not commentary readers, you should subscribe. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It comes once a month. 
for 11 months a year, and each issue brings different ideas, different perspectives on things of culture, on history, on politics, and it's brilliantly packaged and edited. And if you do anything, I think it called, what does it cost? Well, for this audience, $5.99. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a special landing page. We have paper sheets See? outside to give you the URL. Go sign up six bucks. Six we bucks! This wasn't even planned. I thought I was doing. I thought I was doing something nice, and he's already has a whole marketing effort out here. By the way, all of you, all of you, will receive this in your take-home bag. It is a fabulous thing. It's beautifully put together by the Tikva staff. It's called "Selected Jewish Essays of Norman Pothoritz from the Archives of Commentary." Some of them, I believe. Almost all of them will dazzle you when you read somebody that is really a brilliant man who tries to explain the issues of the day and put them in a larger context. But more and most important, we're fortunate today to have John Pothoritz speak about his father and his legacy as the great editor of commentary. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in recognizing and welcoming John Pothoritz. On January 16th, Norman Pothoritz will celebrate his 90th birthday. Could his parents Immigrants from Galicia who never lost their thick accents or their habit of alighting English and Yiddish despite more than a half century in the United States, could they have imagined that one day within the grand ballroom of the once of the grand once known hotel Commodore, built alongside the Grand Central Terminal, a hotel named for Cornelius Vanderbilt the first American tycoon, that this boy would receive an honor in the name of Theodore Herzl. Cornelius Vanderbilt, Theodore Herzl, where would he come to know from Theodore Herzl? <laughs> to describe Julius and Henya Podhoritz as modest people doesn't quite do the word modest justice. They lived then in a railroad flat in Brooklyn with a boarder who slept on the couch and paid them a little rent, a boarder who, upon being told by Norman's mother that she was pregnant and that he would have to vacate the premises because they could not fit all five of them in the apartment, replied in English, like fun I will. <laughs> to the end of her life in 1996, Helen would describe herself as a grinner, a greenhorn, though by that time she had lived nearly 75 years in America and had a famous son and a daughter, Norman's older sister Millie, who became a power behind the throne at New York's City Hall. All this is to say that Norman Podhoritz was not to the manor born, or if he was to any manor born, it was to the Saratoga Manor, a kosher banquet hall in Brownsville, Brooklyn, where his family celebrated his bar mitzvah with a meal that centered on that elegant dish straight from Paris, beef en noodle. <laughs> and yet he barreled through the half-closed doors of American institutions with an almost boundless energy into Columbia College, not, over, not only overcoming its 16% quota on Jewish entrance, but winning a full scholarship besides, then to Cambridge University on a notable fellowship, and then into the strange and savage world he would call the family, the New York Jewish intellectuals who never had a good word to say about anybody except maybe T.S. Eliot, and he wasn't looking too good either. 
What mattered then was literature, criticism. Norman Podhoritz wrote that Saul Bellow's Augie March was false and that William Faulkner's first novel following his Nobel Prize proved that Faulkner was in fact a writer of the second rank. Norman Podhoritz was not even 25 yet. You can call such directness obnoxious or impertinent or inappropriate, but what it showed even at a very young age was a kind of heedless determination to say what he felt needed to be said without qualification. A more prudent young writer might have taken a different path, a more transactional path, with the eminently reasonable notion that a kind word about Saul Bellow might lead to a kind word from Saul Bellow, a helping hand up the ladder. Such transactional behavior, which is a classic expression of worldly ambition, would prove anathematic to Norman Podhoritz. Even the thought of such intellectual compromise was likely to lead to even greater efforts at expressing critical judgment without fear or favor. When he took over as editor of Commentary in 1960 at the age of 30, one might say Norman Podhoritz chose to train a similar critical eye on the then current condition of the United States. Now the country had done as well by him as any country on earth could ever have done in the course of human history for a lowly Jew with no yichus whatever, and he knew it. But even so, he felt there was something undone in America, something incomplete, something unsatisfying about the country that needed improvement, and he wasn't going to let his own feelings of gratitude get in the way of advocating for needed social and political change. And for this set of ideas, he was rewarded. From Saratoga Manor, he climbed to dine with presidents, pal around with celebrities. He knew where Norman Mailer was when Norman Mailer stabbed his wife and fled from the cops. He drank a lot, and where he drank, Elaine's, became the most famous bar in America. He was taken to the famous graveyard of the Brahmins, the Sedgwick Pie in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and seeing a 19th century headstone for a Sedgwick heir named Catherine began dancing around singing, I wish that I could shimmy like my sister Kate. He was not yet 35. He was celebrated. He wasn't world famous and he lived in a rent controlled apartment with a door for a dining room table, but he had a friend named Jackie Kennedy and she once made fun of his clothing and he told her to blank off. <laughs> he was free, and he had to give it all up. Maybe he didn't know he was giving it all up by writing a book called Making It, a book that was supposed to tell it like it was and did, and then it turned out the people whom he told it about didn't like it being told about them one bit. What struck me reading it 15, 50 years later after its release is that despite his good standing at the time as a man of the left, it is a book about being a conservative, about believing in the fundaments of Western culture, about having pride in an ancient ancestry, and about his growing discomfort with the anti-Americanism that was coming to govern the left. He did not realize, perhaps, that what he was doing was making an announcement that he could no longer abide by the orthodoxies of his own side. But they knew. His mentor, Lionel Trilling, even told him he needed to write a final chapter, taking it all back. And you know what? Maybe he should have done it. Maybe he should have taken it all back said he believed that despite everything he had just written, he believed America was a country so fatally flawed that seeking to make it here was to sell your soul and that we all needed to look higher. Maybe he should have done it, because you know why? He would have been happier. He would. He would have stayed friends with his friends who became his ex-friends. He would have stayed at their houses on the Cape and gone to their parties and he wouldn't have found it necessary to vote for Nixon in 72. If you think the goal of life is happiness, he had achieved rather a lot of it by the time the late 60s had rolled around by being part of the inner sanctum of the larger society of the people who run the world. It might only have gotten better 
Maybe the chapter taking it all back would have changed the critical reception of making it, and it would have been a bestseller, and we could have moved to a better neighborhood where I wouldn't have gotten mugged four times before I was 14. I mean, that lousy socialist Irving Howe, he wrote a bestseller and he moved to East 83rd Street, <laughs> just down from the Met. Well, Norman Podhoritz wasn't built for happiness, not in that way. He once came back from a dinner party, this is many years later, thrown by a New York hostess named Alice Mason. And he'd been seated next to some society lady who had said something about abortion and women's bodies or something like that. And he said they got into a huge fight and it was very unpleasant and he was sorry he had gone in the first place. And I said, why, why didn't you just nod and say nothing? After all, you have all kinds of outlets to express your views on these matters. She's just someone at a dinner party who spent five minutes in her entire life reflecting on any of these things. And he said, well, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> and he couldn't either. He had to speak up for that which needed speaking up for. Now, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. You know how you love Israel? You do, you love it. You go there, you get off the plane, you go to Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, you look around, you feel the miracle, the joy, the wonder. Some of you have apartments there, you have mishpacha there, you are Zionist because you love Israel. Guess who doesn't love Israel? <laughs> I, I mean, he really doesn't love Israel. Norman Podhoritz went to Israel for the first time in 1950. This is a true story. He went to visit his first cousin, the only member, sorry, the only member of the family who had made Aliyah. He was picked up and brought to their house in North Tel Aviv. The first thing that got him was it was a house. His parents and my grandfather's brothers had been sending money to these relatives in Palestine for years. They all lived in tenements. These cousins lived in a goddamn house. They'd been supporting people who lived in better circumstances than they had. They sat down for lunch and proudly his cousin said they'd been saving up their rations for him for a month and they put down in front of him a soft-boiled egg. There is nothing Norman Podhoritz hates more on earth than a soft-boiled egg. Nothing. He told them, thank you, no. But remember, these were Israelis. He told them no, and they wouldn't take no for an answer. And he told them no again, they wouldn't take no for an answer. And so he had to eat the soft-boiled egg. That was nearly 70 years ago, and he still hasn't forgiven Israel. <laughs> and yet, when there was no one among American intellectuals to defend Israel during the Lebanon invasion in 1982, who defended Israel? When there was no one who would take up arms against the anti-Semitic assaults on Israel by the hell-dwelling likes of Gore Vidal, who took up those arms? And whose shift to the right in the late 1960s came in part because he saw with prescience the way the left was moving hurriedly away from Israel and toward the Arabs who wished to destroy it in the wake of the 67 war. So what I'm saying is that Norman Podhoritz hasn't lived his life in a way that was designed by his own lights to maximize his own happiness. Even the way he worked as an editor, he burnished those manuscripts issue after issue, year after year, decade after decade, until they glittered. The work of other people, other writers, whom he made look good in a task that is, for the most part, utterly thankless. I say, for the most part, to anyone in this room whom I edit. <laughs> He was once editing an article by the eminent political scientist Hans Morgenthau, an emigre who had learned English later in life. Morgenthau objected to some revision of a sentence, but Hans Norman said, what you wrote was ungrammatical, and in his thick German accent, Morgenthau said, and how would you know? <laughs> he knew. 
He has written a dozen books, works of history, literary criticism, autobiography, biography, exegesis, political analysis. He is among the handful, and I mean the literal handful, of legendary American editors of the 20th century, acknowledged as such by all who understand what an editor is and what he does. As an editor, he published great essays, great fiction, great polemic, and he didn't even write all of them himself. He did it for 35 years with unflagging energy and ambition, and then, as Roger said, he turned the ship over to Neil Cosadoy, whose own meticulousness and fineness of vision and spirit made it the most formidable publication in America for another 14. So now I run it. It's not as good, <laughs> but I try. So what, as his 90th birthday approaches, what is it that Norman Podhoritz got in place of the social happiness, the being a part of the action? He found he had had to sacrifice half a century ago because integrity demanded it. Well, in my view, he got something better. He got richness. He lived to see one of the two great evils of our age, the Soviet Union, vanish from the earth in part because of his determination to keep American leaders from acting out of weakness to prop it up. He has lived to see Israel, that nascent dump with the rationed soft-boiled eggs, become the 28th wealthiest, wealthiest country on earth, engaged in secret alliances with Saudi Arabia, and has lived to see four grandchildren and two great-grandchildren born on its soil. And along the way, there came nine other grandchildren, including my three kids, and 10 other great-grandchildren. And we, and they, and all of you are the inheritors of his legacy, a legacy that demands of us that we tell the truth even when we wish to do anything but. A legacy that says a person born in these United States is a person who has been given the greatest reward any human being on this earth has ever been gifted. A legacy that calls upon us to look to the ancient past and to the wellspring from which we have risen, the revelation at Sinai and the words of Devarim, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. It is for these reasons that Tikva has awarded Norman Podhoritz the Herzl Prize. <clears throat> and I speak for my sisters and my mother, for his 13 grandchildren, and for his 12 great-grandchildren, in offering our most profound thanks to Roger Hertog and the Tikva board for doing him this ineffable honor. Roger Hertog told me I was not to make a speech. And I, everything Roger tells me to do, I do. Uh, and in case I thought of rebelling for once, uh, God struck me almost dumb with a serious case of laryngitis. Uh, so I'm not going to make a speech, but I am going to tell you a joke. <laughs> I, I have to confess that after Roger's introduction to John and John's introduction of me, I was for once in my life reduced to um, stupefied silence. Uh, thank you is a very, very inadequate response. But I do have a complaint. And the, <laughs> and the complaint is embodied in my favorite Jewish joke, which has an, uh, many of you here who've heard me speak have heard this joke before, but it's all right. It's worth hearing twice. <laughs> it, 
it has a very unlikely venue, which is the deathbed of a very, very elderly Hasidic Rebbe who was surrounded by his Talmud and his students who were weeping and wailing and tearing their clothes at the imminent loss of their beloved Rebbe. And one of them said, oh, how will we survive without our Rebbe? He is the most learned man of the age. And who will be there to teach us Torah when he is gone? And another piped up and said, oh, how will we live without our Rebbe? He is the wisest man on earth. And who will set us an example of prudent conduct when he is gone? And a third, not to be outdone, said, how will we survive the death of our Rebbe? He is the most ethical man on earth, and who will set us an example of moral behavior when he is gone? And they wept and they wailed. And the old man, with the last ounce of strength in his failing body, lifted himself up in his elbow, on his elbow, and said, and about my humility, you have nothing to say? <laughs> Neither, neither Roger nor John had a word to say about my humility, which, which is world famous. So I will once again thank Tikva, which this uh, uh, has grown into a formidable organization. Uh, I will thank Roger, to whom I owe um, more than I can calculate. And I will think my son, my Kaddish, as I used to call him, uh, who has not allowed Donald Trump to drive us apart. <laughs> I won't tell you which side I'm on, and he's in case you don't know. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I have to say that, uh, uh, the joke aside, I truly am humbled by this honor and this occasion. Uh, and I will leave you with that way of expressing my thanks. <laughs>